Well, good morning. I want to begin by thanking the CSG for this invitation. Working on the stream has been very challenging, uh, particularly for the following reason. Uh, if Commons is a concept that only recently re-entered the, the, the public debate, its relationship with infrastructure is still an even less explored territory. I'm an activist, I do, and I do academic research on, on commons and commodification, but I'm hardly an expert on, on that specific matter, infrastructure. But I hope I can convince you that uh, building commons, enabling infrastructures, is something really crucial if we want to advance commons as a paradigm. So, short summary of what I'm going to talk about today. First, what are infrastructures? What do I mean by infrastructure here? What are most infrastructures like today? Then I'll present two challenges in moving forward to more commons enabling infrastructures. And I'll finish by presenting some emerging examples of alternative uh, experimentations with infrastructure and the tensions that underlie them. So what, what I mean by infrastructures here? Infrastructures are systems that enable and mediate certain activities. They usually have material aspects, such as goods and services, and also immaterial aspects, social relations, which are blended together. Infrastructures are produced in the sense of socially and historically constructed. And not, they're not naturally given. This is something important. And particularly important to take into account when we're thinking about the social relations aspect. Our current dependence on markets, for instance, is not something written in stone in human nature, but rather a consequence of social relations that we have produced. But going back to that definition, many goods and services we produce can also be seen as tools that enable us to do certain activities. Say, for example, a car. A car, so, a car also enables us to do certain things, to go places or to do other things. Why don't we think of a single car as an infrastructure? Well, the reason is that an infrastructure, as the word suggests, lies beneath and, and extends beyond an individual or, or small case or small scale use of tools for an activity. Infra, as you probably know, is Latin for beneath. In this example, the infrastructure is not the car itself. But the, the single car, but the system of roads, traffic signals, and traffic rules. Traffic rules are particularly important in, in this example. They're necessary because the infrastructure can involve the usage of a huge set of resources, say roads, for instance, by many different actors. This implies that infrastructures are eminently social systems. But just as a side note, this does not mean that the car is by contrast a purely objective thing. A car also implies social relations. A car is built by hundreds of workers. It's, it's usually bought by wage labor and so on. With infrastructures, however, the social aspect is much more prominent because of the, the, the shared usage. So there are many reasons to explain why this kind of shared usage by multiple actors is convenient. We can think of, for instance, the, the infrastructure might be too expensive to be provided individually, as is the case of a, a railroad. It also might be related to activities that require some degree of coordination, protocols, or some collective agreement, say the use of, of spectrum in, in, in communications. Or it could be related to activities that we socially value and see as basic rights, and thus we collectively decide to undertake in common, as in the case of public health, education, sanitation. This shared and social character of infrastructures also means that they have the potential to be uh, commons, to be related to commons. Unfortunately, that potential is not exactly what we see happening the most today. Most of the current infrastructures are designed to favor and extend commodity production. This is one first characteristic. The second one is that 
Many of the existing infrastructures foster individualistic and environmentally destructive behavior. But I'll get back to the second characteristic later. First, let me open a parenthesis here to clarify the distinction between commodities and commons. When I talk about commodity production here, I should warn you that I'm using a less known meaning of this term. I'll try not to bore you with the academic lingo, but I'm mostly building upon Marx and Kaupolani's definitions of commodities. Commodities for them are goods produced to a very specific set of social relations. Private producers are in general separated from, from workers who, not, who do not own means of production and from consumers who are related to uh, the production only by the market. Also in the sphere of commodities, production and reproduction of life are separated. The labor to manufacture a car and say the unpaid labor done by uh, a woman in her family's household are treated as if they were fundam fundamentally different, something we saw on the previous presentation by Heike. And what's most important for my argument here, markets play an essential role in commodity production. They are the two to decide what should be produced and how much of it, something that also came up in, in, Josh, in Joshua's presentation. This is problematic as markets are almost an indirect index of societal needs. What they're really good at is measuring profitability. Commons, on the other hand, are things shared, things shared by a community and the social practices, the commoning, necessary to maintain this sharing, including the production, the production of su such things in some cases, their maintenance, their distribution, and so on. Unlike with commodities, the markets in commons are not a, a mandatory additional me mediating instance. The, the commons itself fulfills the role of determining what should be produced and how it should be distributed. Also, in commons, productive and reproductive act activities are not necessarily distinguished. This might happen, but this is not uh, necessary to, the, to how a commons work. So after this parenthesis, it should be clear that most infrastructures built until today favor commodity production instead of commons. Even though the majority of this infrastructure was built by states and not by private actors. In Brazil, that's where I come from, there are clear examples of this with infrastructures built for mining and agribusiness. Much of Maristela Svampa's talk yesterday applies here. Uh, so we, we have in Brazil large dams for powering aluminum processing industries, uh, public research centers concentrating on their efforts in sugarcane or soy research. All this investment fuels activities such as mining and monocultures, which are environment, environmentally destructive, which profit large export-driven corporations, and which are socially corrosive as they kill jobs and livelihoods, they promote dispossession, and they make food production more expensive as they compete for land. Finally, aside from state-run infrastructures, there are also those infrastructures that are fully integrated with commodity production, either because they were privatized or because from the start they were built to be sold as commodities by private actors. And now back to that second characteristic of infrastructures which is clearly related to the, first, to the previous one. Most of current infrastructures foster individualistic behavior, behavior that is environmentally destructive as well. An obvious, an obvious example is the prevailing car culture. I think Goofy here illustrates well this, the, the individualist, individualistic aspect of it. Uh, we should not forget though this, that this individualism is also not intrinsic to human nature, but owes a great deal to public efforts and investment in infrastructures that favor, favored automobile and oil industries. For instance, in urban planning in the USA, and in the case of industri industrialization policies in Latin America in the second half of the past century. Well, this something that's important also to mention is 
this is by definition not common, not commons enabling. Individualism goes uh, is problematic when, when when we're thinking of commons. So now that I've painted quite a green picture of our current context, let us step back a little and reflect about what could or needs to be done to change that so that we can have progressively more commons enabling infrastructures. In that sense, I'll propose two, two challenges. The first one is to turn existing infrastructures into commons. This boils down to questions such as, how can communities appropriate themselves of existing state-provided infra infrastructures and put them to work for commons? How to make the management of these infrastructures more directly democratic? In this challenge, it is also important to recognize the limitations and affordances of certain kinds of infrastructures. Consider car sharing initiatives. They're creative and certainly useful ways, probably even necessary ways, to minimize the problems of car, of car culture. But they don't change the underlying infrastructure which still disfavors collective or human power transportation over fossil fuel-based individual commodities, cars. We must be aware of those limitations, but that certainly shouldn't stop us from strategically working within them. The second challenge is to turn commons into infrastructures on a wider societal level. Well, many commons are indeed infrastructures, if we take that definition of, a definition of systems that enable multiple actors to do certain activities. Many commons, though, are, are quite topic-specific. For instance, a, free software, a specific free software project, or are restricted, restricted geographically. The issue then becomes, how can they be expanded, proliferated, and networked so that our society is less dependent on commodities. Well, I really wanted to say that don't panic. I, I have the ready answers to those two challenges, life, the universe, and everything else, but obviously I don't. What I'm going to do instead in the final part of this talk is presenting a few examples of an alternative approach to, to infrastructures that might be more commons enabling. These are most def definitely not the only ones that are, that are out there. And I chose them because they may highlight interesting tensions and contradictions that appear in this context. Or, particularly in the final case, because I suspect many people are not familiar with them. So I'll start by just mentioning very briefly two examples. The first is called GuifiNet and it's a large and successful community-shared computer network. One tension that it displays is its sort of fragility. As most, uh, most of the rest of the Internet's infrastructure is private and not a commons, the infrastructure itself. Uh, GuifiNet is connected to the Internet, and that's one of the main uh, usages that, that, that it offers. But that connection is certainly a strategical bottleneck. Another example is the use of smart grids for decentralized energy production. While they could help some uh, energy producing commons based initiatives, it would add a mark to help those, those initiatives to sustain themselves. It would add a market layer if those initiatives wanted to share energy among themselves. They, also, they would always have to go through the market to, to, to share energy between different commons initiatives. Uh, also, the trend, favor the trend that favors smart grids no nowadays is not driven by commons. It's, it's cl clearly driven by the, the green capitalist paradigm, which ignores the issue of, of excessive consumption, and also by the fact that the sector has been largely privatized. And there's the issue of fragmentation that also asks for, for smart grids for, for, for technical reasons as well. My second example is a specific from Brazil, a school in the north region of Brazil called Marabá Rural Campus. This is a photo of, the activi of an activity in, in the campus. It's a branch of a public higher education institute, 
and it offers technical and undergrad degrees in fields such as agriculture and rural education. I find it an interesting case of communities trying to appropriate themselves of, straight, of state infrastructures, such as those of public education. This reading of mine uh, is based on the fact that the school is, is focused, even through its student selection mechanisms, on peasant movements involved with land reform, on indigenous peoples and quilombos, which are former slave communities. While extremely diverse, the communities from those groups are usually very pro-commons, and in many cases, they are even strictly, strictly commons-based, sharing land and producing collectively. Along with workers' unions, those communities were di directly responsible for the pressure that led the government to build the school, only because of this pressure that the, the, the school was, was built this way. Even the land where it is located was, was donated by MST, which is the, the Brazilian Landless Workers Movement. The location is particularly relevant. It's surrounded by lots allocated to, to land reform in a, town called, in a town called El Dorado dos Carajás. Uh, does that name ring a bell here in this room? Yeah. Well, that's where in, in 1996, 19 people were murdered by the police during, uh, during a, a manifestation for, for land reform. 10 of the 19 murdered were shot point blank. In a sense, this is really a battleground between commons-based initiatives on the one side and new extractivism and land speculation on the other. The, uh, the, the owner of a ranch on, on the region was, was charged of paying the police to, to, to murder the people, but he was never convicted. I also apologize for a cartoon that, unlike the others I've shown before, doesn't come even, co doesn't come even close to being funny. And I, I note that I sometimes quote the, the, the author when they get back to the commons, which is the case of Carlos Latouf. His cartoons are always copyleft. The Maraba campus has small-scale fam uh, small family farming, agroecology, and food sovereignty as its principles, and blends them with research focused on the community's needs and knowledges. One of the strategies to achieve this is, called, is the so-called alternation pedagogy. One-third of the students' formative time is spent in their respective communities. This allows for a richer educational process minimizes rural exodus, and strengthens threaten ind indigenous cultures. There are definitely tensions in this example as well, mostly in the, relation, in the relationship with the state. The Brazilian government since Lula, and including his government to, to a certain extent, shows a, la a lack of practical commitment to land reform. So the risk of cooptation in, in this case looms. There's also the issue of how to guarantee participative management. While this preoccupation is expressed in the, the school's institutional organization, it also depends a lot on struggles. Just to exemplify this, the dean of the larger institution the campus is, is attached to was, was jailed last year, accused of diverting millions of dollars. While the school lacked so much infrastructure, how ironical, that the students went on, went on a strike to ask for clean, clean water and uh, a bridge to be built so, they, they, so that they could reach the school when it was raining. Well, thanks for, uh, for your attention. And before I finish, I, I, I would just like to give a special uh, thanks to St Stefan Meritz, who helped a lot in conceiving and preparing this talk. So, so a round of applause for him, please. <laughs>